Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We all awake now? <laughs> when we're talking about life, we have to show a little bit of that. <laughs> Actually, we're talking about not only life in this present tense, but life in the greater scheme of things. Life, as we talked about it last week, in terms of reincarnation. The fact that we're here and now, and at some point we'll leave this experience, but have the opportunity to come back again. And we've had many opportunities leading up until this. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, it's the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterwards return again. You know, when you bring up the whole topic of reincarnation, what almost follows in inherently on the heels of that idea is karma. What is karma? And what does that mean to you and me on our spiritual journey? Now, the whole process of reincarnation and karma actually helps us answer some of life's bigger questions. I've had a few over the years. See if you relate to some of these. <coughs> Why did my good friend, who was joy and enthusiasm and blessed so many people, die of a heart attack at the age of 51? I mean, really, there's so many other people in the world that we do much better without. Why my friend? <laughs> what about my friend, my girlfriend, who was chaperoning a snow tubing party for a bunch of high school kids and wound up paralyzed from the waist down? Why her? What about babies? Sweet, innocent little children that are born with birth defects or diseases? Or you and me? Why do we live in this country with so much opportunity before us instead of a, a hovel in the Andes or a slum in Bangladesh? How do we make sense of things like war, famine, rape, AIDS, so many other tragedies. And we ask ourselves, what kind of creator would visit these tragedies on its creation? Uh, we blame the creator for so much when in fact we are the unwitting instigators and participants of all we see. The answers to these questions and more are found in the understanding of karma and reincarnation. And as we understand karma and reincarnation, our own personal and spiritual journey here and now is enhanced. <coughs> what is the purpose of reincarnation? We touched on this just a little bit last week, and because it ties so closely to karma, we need to remember what that is. You see, you and I were created in perfection. We were initially in oneness with the Creator. And then we had this idea that we wanted to experience life in a world of polarity, in a world of good and bad, right and wrong, black and white. We kind of ventured off with the Creator's blessing to experience life this way. But what happened in that experience as we began to emanate not just pure, wonderful, uplifting energy, but we also accrued in our missteps and stumbles along the way what I like to call heavy energy. It's often called negative energy, but I use the terms heavy and light so I can take judgment out of things like negative and positive. So as we've gone through this life, as we've gone through successive lives, made mistakes, done things less than brilliantly, we have accrued negative or heavy energy. And we can't be fully united, we can't be fully one with the allness of the Creator when we're energetically out of balance. Does that make sense? Karma is that process that brings us back into balance so that we can get to that point of unity with all the ineffable is. The word karma is a Sanskrit word. It means action, word, 
or deed. And very, very simply stated, karma is what we call the law of cause and effect. What we put out comes back to us. We talk about that all the time, don't we? We talk about it in terms of our life here and now, and we can talk about it in terms of what I call the big picture, that eons of experience that you and I, our souls, have had in life everlasting. For we are eternal at our soul level. The idea of karma has been well known long before recorded religion started talking about it. Buddha understood and incorporated the idea of karma and teachings of karma into what he taught his disciples. In the Hindu religion, it was well known and brutally misapplied in the development of a very stringent class system. If you do your religious study, if you do your comparative religion, you will find that every single major religion in the world teaches a law of cause and effect, or what we sow, we reap. What we put out comes back to us. The energy of our thoughts, our intentions, and our actions do come back to us for better or worse, depending on what we put out. They affect our life here and now, and in the big picture. People get a little confused sometimes about what karma is and what it isn't. What karma is not, it is not predestination. You are not required by any higher thought or higher entity or higher being to behave in a certain way because of some karmic attitude you've developed over time. We are not predestined. We are beings of free will and free choice, which means we and we alone create our own heaven or our own hell. If there are errors and problems that are punishing us, well, that's what we put out coming back to us. And by the same token, if good things are flowing into our life, that also is what we've put out coming back to us. The further we stray from higher principles, the greater our suffering and our sense of being punished. But that is a misunderstood sense of punishment. Because karma is not about punishment. There is no deity that's out to slap us around and correct us for past mistakes. Really, what kind of benevolent creator would visit ill on its creation for any reason? As I said before, we are the unwitting instigators and participants in our own unhappiness, our own challenges. Infinite love created all that is continuously calling our souls to an eternal state of bliss, the ultimate goal of resolved karma, the ultimate goal of reincarnation. All the errors of 10,000 lifetimes can never destroy that essence of who we are as a creation of the Creator. Our soul is forever in the image of God. That means that any karma consequences we might accrue apply to ego and personality, not to our very soul. And all souls will eventually unite with Mother, Father, God. A Hitler, an Obama, bin, oh, Osama bin Laden, a Saddam, all of those souls, like you and I, have their own karma to work through, and they will. So for you and I as spiritual seekers, why do we want to understand karma? Why even talk about it? 
Well, it helps us understand ourselves a little bit better, what our own propensities tend to be, what our own challenges tend to be. It helps us develop an appreciation for our challenges. We appreciate those difficulties in life, not as just problems to be overcome, but as teachers and opportunities that ultimately balance karma. It also invites us to look at challenges, whether they're our own or challenges we see others experiencing, from a broader perspective and with greater insight, which hopefully leads to greater compassion. And understanding karma helps us understand the power and the value of the spiritual principles we teach here at Unity all the time. So, who wants to stay karmically stuck? <laughs> no takers? <laughs> well, we tend to do it to ourselves unwittingly on occasion. If you want to stay karmically stuck, practice attachment. Get attached to this world. Get attached to material things. Get attached to things of this world with a glomming, I can't live without an approach. Attachment is about sensory-based living, living for and through our senses, which is not to say our senses are wrong, but how much priority do we place on them, and how much do we live from our sensory experience as opposed to higher spiritual experiences. Attachment also involves ego-based living. You know, it's all about me. Lies in the face of healthy, uplifted, positive, balanced karma. Our earthly desires, our habits, draw us back to the earth experience again and again and again. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does keep us coming back and may prevent us from moving to a higher spiritual experience in greater unity with all that God is. There's a quote you might be familiar with that says, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. This is an acknowledgement that our attachment to earthly things make it very challenging for us to move to a place of higher spiritual being, to live from more positive, uplifting, karmic ways. Another way to stay karmically, ta uh, um, karmically stuck is to blame. We blame our problems on others when in fact Others who may be causing us pain and irritation and discomfort are actually helping us deal with our karma should we choose to embrace the problem. To stay karmically stuck, practice self-pity or victim consciousness. That's part of what blame is all about. When we're in that state of victim consciousness, that dilutes our power to overcome. It dilutes our innate spiritual capacities, and it abdicates self-responsibility. If you want to stay karmically stuck, be selfish. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It doesn't matter what you want or need. Selfishness is a lack of compassion. It's a refusal to reach out and be there for others in positive ways. In the Buddhist tradition, the monks go out each morning with a begging bowl. They take their bowl and they go door to door and they receive whatever is given. But what that does for them and for the giver is layered. For the monk, it's about trusting that all of their needs will be met. For the monk, it's all about being detached from material things. And it creates for those people filling those begging bowls the opportunity to show compassion 
and to be generous in their giving. Oh, and if you really want to stay karmically stuck, try non-forgiveness <laughs> and its sidekicks, anger and resentment. Boy, talk about heavy energy. Talk about energy that won't let us move forward. Ill feelings, anger, resentment just bog us down here and now and in our greater spiritual journey. That's non-forgiveness is also about attachment. Our attachment to worldly things, our attachment to needing to have it our own way, our attachment to I'm right and you're wrong. That is the kind of attachment that keeps us from growing spiritually. That is the kind of attachment that limits and actually sets us back in our karmic expression. Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore says, the study of reincarnation and karma is not profitable to the student of higher thought. Hmm, I guess maybe we better pick a new topic here today. <laughs> he goes on to say, what you have been isn't important. What you are now is the issue. And he goes on to say that human suffering and the whole process of karma is actually a sign of man's ignorance of spiritual law. And this leads us to some important insights. How to resolve karma, how to balance out heavy karma with lighter karma that lifts us up. You may want to replace the word karma with energy, if that helps you understand it better. How do we balance out heavy energy with lighter energy so that we can literally move to a higher place of consciousness and connection with the Creator. In the book, The Wisdom of Yogananda, talking about karma and reincarnation, we are told that the number one best way to resolve and balance heavy karma, heavy energy, is through the practice of meditation. We're told error is the crust hiding behind the perfect soul, made eternally in God's image. Meditation dissolves the crust, revealing the perfection of the soul. Deep meditation roasts karma in the fires of wisdom. Every moment we spend in what we call the silence or the gap resolves heavy karma. When we seek God in that inner silence, when we know divine love itself, when we live from love as a result of our time in meditation, that is when karma, our karma, is being resolved. That's when our energy is being lifted up. Old heavy energy is burned away, and lighter, newer, brighter energy flows to us and through us. And as we meditate daily, attuning to that infinite wisdom that's behind karmic law, that still small voice of our intuition will divinely guide our thoughts words and deeds, day in and day out. Yogananda goes on to tell us to practice self-control. Are your habits, thoughts, and desires controlling you, or do you direct them? When asked to expound on what karma was, the Buddha answered his disciples simply with the phrase, karma is thought. What he was saying is what you think is behind everything you say and do. So if you want to focus on karma, on higher energy, on lightening and brightening who you are as a karmic expression, watch your thoughts. Because as we know here in unity, thoughts are things. And what we think, we begin to express 
and the world around us by what we say and do. It's very simple, but not real easy, is it? To be constantly monitoring, day in and day out, 24-7, those thoughts that we're choosing to entertain. And yet, New Thought 101, what we teach here at Unity, and Karma 101 are one and the same. What you think is what you get. Yogananda also talks about detachment. And he reminds us that attachment is fear that's based on insecurity. And the need that we have as human beings for security stems from the fact that we forget who we are as spiritual beings. That as spiritual beings fully expressing that we can draw anything into our life with one need and desire. But when something comes into our life that we perceive as good or something is outside of our life that we want, and we glom onto it, that's about attachment. And that's about forgetting the spiritual capacity we have to create what we want and need and desire. Attachment comes from lack consciousness and desire for what we don't have, to people, to places, to things, to money, whatever it is we're seeking, that desire creates what can be an unhealthy detachment. Yogananda says, strive for health, prosperity, and wisdom without fear of failure, remaining non-attached at all times. In the Buddhist tradition, they talk about mindfulness, or staying in the present, as a remedy for clinging, as a remedy for attachment. Think about this. If we don't dwell on for example, happy or sad memories, what is there to adhere to? If we don't hope or dream about a better future, what is there to be worried about? Understanding karma likewise helps us move past our human attachment to ourselves and our needs and desires and generates genuine compassion for all of us. Yogananda also talks about resolving karma through what he referred to as morality. Morality to him meant accuse no one, not even yourself. Stay out of judgment. Live in a way that invites no complaint. Be true to yourself at all times. He also reminded us that to resolve heavy karma, forgiveness of self and others is necessary. Harboring ill feelings is glomming on to heavy energy, and that's heavy karma. No wonder every faith system in the world teaches forgiveness as a basic spiritual practice. When we forgive ourselves, when we forgive others, we let go of that heavy negative energy and open ourselves to a higher layer energy, to a higher way of being, and in that process, resolve karmic challenges. Finally, surrender. What we talked about this morning in our daily word, let go and let God surrender to higher will. We know in unity that the will of the divine for each and every one of us is that we experience and manifest as much absolute good in this life as we can. Boy, I'm up for that challenge, aren't you? Let's manifest good and wonderful things for ourselves, for the people around us, for this spiritual center, guided by that higher will. It takes commitment and concentration to attune to that higher will. And that circles us right back to meditation, because that is when and where and how 
we most powerfully connect with the divine's highest will for us. As we surrender to divine will, we are enabled to expand consciousness and increase our dominion, our management over ourselves and all matters in our life. In other words, we are empowered to make good, healthy decisions for ourselves as spiritual travelers having an earthly experience. In Romans 13, it says this, love is the fulfillment of the law. What law is that? It's the law of karma. Living from balance and love, which at its very, is at the very core of all spiritual principles and practices, living from that resolves karma and restores us to a state capable of unity with the ineffable creator. <coughs> love is the fulfillment of the law. And if we keep that for in our mind, we will be on the path to live a joyful, fulfilling life here and now and to contribute to a joyful and fulfilling experience in the big picture. So let's visit our affirmation for the day once again. <coughs> it's on your bulletin or perhaps on the screen here. Our affirmation is this. Together, grateful for the gift of life. I develop spiritually as I faithfully practice spiritual principles. And so it is.